Good day, Billy. First of all, thanks for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. For our audience, could you please introduce yourself and tell us where you live and work and what you currently do? Okay, no problem. Um, yeah, my name is Billy Wilson. Uh, I uh, live uh, just outside of Toronto, Ontario, in Canada. And uh, I am, uh, I work at uh, the uh, big power company in Ontario. Uh, I'm not going to say its name, but it's, uh, it's in Ontario and it's into power generation. And uh, what I do is, uh, right now, I am an e tr nuclear training, e-learning developer, designer, analyst, and I do data. And I uh, work on processes and procedures and all kinds, just anything related right now to uh, nuclear training, specifically, well, usually for the, the training uh areas that I cover uh, are fairly technical. So I have the engineering science courses, which are more education based Then I have stuff for operators. Um, so it'd be operations procedures and, and or uh, po policy and methods, and then some things about performance improvement. So I have uh, a couple of courses related to our corrective action program and how to, well, it's there, it's a continuing training course, but it's for uh, a parent cause, what we call a parent cause evaluation. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Can you tell us where you grew up and uh, where'd you go to college and where'd you study? Okay, well, this is a could be a really long story. Go but ahead. I'm just gonna, yeah, but I'm just going to shorten it and say my I'm from the U.S. originally, and um, my dad was U.S. Army, and uh, after he served his to a tour in Vietnam, he went to Korea. And uh, as a, as a comb as an engineer, met my mother. I was born in Korea, and then we moved every two to four years from that point forward until we settled in uh, Huntsville, Northern Alabama. So it's Huntsville, Alabama, which is mostly people not from Alabama. It's the home of the U.S. Army Missile Command and NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. So. For instance, when I was in high school, um, the space shuttle solid rocket boosters used to be tested sometimes during the daytime, and we would feel it <coughs> across town. Um, and my high school, well, actually, yeah, well, my high school was named after uh, Virgil Grissom, who uh, was one of the Apollo astronauts that died in uh, in a capsule on the pad, along with, uh, God, I want to say it's Chaffee and White. Um, so there are middle middle school and elementary schools named after the and high school named after those three astronauts. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a space town. It's a and it's a. <laughs> uh, I literally had friends where uh, that had both of their parents were rocket scientists, right? <laughs> so it's one of those. It sounds funny, but it's, it was literally literally true in Huntsville. Um, and from there, um, I went to Mississippi State University um, in Starkville, Mississippi. Um, and, uh, don't ever mistake that with Ole Miss. It's a completely different place. And it's, that's, that's a sin to mistake those two. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, so that was, well, what did you, I, what did you study in college? Yeah. So I studied, uh, nuclear engineering and, um, I chose that because no one else in my high school put their name down next to nuclear engineering on this big piece of paper on the wall. And, and because my dad was an engineer, I knew I was going to do some kind of engineering, but nobody else chose nuclear. And you have to remember, this was it, this was 1987, okay? Chernobyl happened in 1986. So you have to think about what kind of person chooses nuclear engineering the year after the worst nuclear accident ever at, to that point. Mm -hmm. So that's who I am. Thank you. So, how did you go from that program in college? What was your career progression? How did you uh, end up in Toronto working for the big unnamed power company? Yes. Well, so my, my first job out of uh, university, so I, I stayed and I, I got a master's in nuclear engineering as well at the same university. And then I first started work, my first job um, was with a, a company called Entergy, which is a big uh, utility across several states in the South. And um, so 
I worked in the, for the first year and a half, I worked in the corporate office, the central design engineering office doing nuclear engineering analysis. I loved that job. I couldn't, when I got there, I couldn't believe they were paying me to do the stuff I was doing. I mean, that's just how, like after all those years in university, to finally be doing the stuff I was doing was just amazing. Um, but then shortly after that, you know, you're working in the, in the corporate office and you're thinking, you know what, I'd like to get out to a plant. So after that, I moved to um, Riverbend Station, which is uh, in Louisiana, um, near Baton Rouge. It's in a town called St. Francisville, a uh, very you know, small town, uh, nice place. Um, didn't like the weather much, but I loved the food, um, and I loved that job. I loved that job, too. I did things in that job that, um, like, to this day, I still remember like being in the control room and doing certain things as an engineer, right? I was never going to be an operator. That's just what's not in my DNA. Um, but I really loved being in the control room as a reactor engineer doing the stuff that I did. Um, and that, uh, so that kind of set me up for, well, my life is kind I'm kind of like a pinball, right? So I bounce off of things. So I met a girl, I got married, I moved out to California, I took a different job and, you know, I hit a bumper there and I ended up coming back alone. <laughs> and then, um. And then I was back in Louisiana for a, a while, and then I, I met uh, my current wife. Um, she's going to kill me for saying this out loud, but we met online. And then uh, she was in Canada, and I came up here, and that's how I'm here. That's so I, Yeah, so I, I came up here in the early 2000s. Well, so. it's interesting that you ended up in the learning and development profession through this nuclear engineering route. Uh, maybe we'll get back to that a little bit later. But I wanted to... I, I asked you if you were going to wear that scarf that you wore at the very beginning of this because that's part of your LinkedIn profile picture and also with the uh, ball cap that you were wearing. So I just want to explain that to our audience here that I asked for you to do that. Um, <laughs> anyway, so, um, so can you talk to us a little bit about your first exposure to HPT, human performance technology, or however you refer to it? Coming from your background, what 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 did you guys call that kind of a thing? Was it known as that or something else? Yeah, it was actually known as human performance, but it's got it comes from a different place from what I see a lot of HPT terminology. So, like, because um, being in the, in the nuclear industry, we if you the best way to characterize it is we are preoccupied with failure, mm -hmm. like that, like. Avoiding failure. That, that is one of the overriding characteristics of, of nu the nuclear power industry is, like, we say it, we, what we say is nuclear safety is our overriding priority, right? Mm -hmm. Number one, nothing else even comes close to it. And we don't just say it. I mean, well, maybe there are some people that just say it, but, like, most of us actually mean it, right? Um it's the first thing you think about. And so the idea of performing and keeping things safe is what drives much of what, most of what we do. Um, so when we, we had, a, we have a term, human performance, but it's, it starts from safety. So we have, and we, and our, and our notion of human performance starts at the individual level. So it's going to include basic practices at the individual level, things like, and we, we have specific names for them. We call them human performance tools or event free tools. Mm -hmm. So you can see the, the, you can see the focus there is on event free, no events. We don't want events. So we have things we call like self checking procedure, use and adherence, questioning attitude, conservative decision making, situational awareness, um, uh, pre-job briefing, post-job debriefing, all kinds of things like this. And then we get into bigger or tools for knowledge workers, right? So that'd be like front, everybody can use those, mm -hmm. right? That's just checking everything you do, making sure you're doing everything you're supposed to be doing, understanding where you are, what's going on around you, and what's changing around you. Um, 
then there's tools that we you know work better for like for like say for engineers for instance uh, we have things like validate assumptions it's a specific tool and has specific steps mm-hmm. um, one is called precision in communication because if you're going to end if you're going to issue engineering guidance you better make sure that is absolutely clear and cannot be misinterpreted right um, so there are all kind, and, it, and then it starts getting into the wider organizational context. So when we talk about human performance in the nuclear business, we're talking about something that starts at the individual, but then expands out to the whole organization. So it includes things like culture, process, um, organizational weaknesses, right? Flawed defenses. Um, we talk about how does how does uh, an adverse event happen? Well, there's a, there's an initiator, but there was probably a flawed defense, and there was probably a latent organizational weakness, and there's a number of factors that can come together to cause an event to spiral out of what you would call positive control, mm-hmm. right? Um, now. Not to say that we have a whole lot of failures that spiral out of control. But we consider failures, we, we consider near misses or you stopped, this event stopped two or three levels short of being serious. We're going to investigate that as if it had continued mm-hmm. or what can we learn to make sure that we never get to that point again and anything else we learn along the way, we want to make sure we don't get there either. Um, we're not perfect. Nobody's perfect, um, but we are definitely preoccupied with the idea of preventing failure in all ways possible. Mm-hmm. So that's level performance, right? But then on top of that, right? So I spent a good part of my career doing um, root cause analysis. Mm-hmm. You have corrective action, uh, correct, corrective action programs and root cause analysis. So a significant portion of my career was spent investigating events. So we, So we've pulled things in from like, say, engineering practice, like failure modes and effects analysis, or from like, if you think of like NASA and fault tree analysis, where they, where they would go through and try to figure out all the possible ways something could go wrong or contribute to a problem. Then we throw in things that we learn from, you know, industrial safety. Um, We talk about hazards and barriers and targets, right? So, and the hierarchy of control. So everything, all the language we have around what you would call human performance or HPT or human performance technology, we use a lot of the same concepts, but it's all coming from a safety um, basis that's and a preoccupation with don't let the bad stuff happen. So, yeah. I, I understand. That's, uh, that's perfectly reasonable given the... Uh, severity of the consequences of failure in your business. It's like people in the military in certain aspect parts of the military, you know, the consequences are, are extreme and uh, extremely negative. And therefore there's a lot of attention paid to the details and to procedures and et cetera uh, with uh, risk mitigation, identifying risks and, and mitigating them and, uh, you know, trying to eliminate the, uh, causes of all sorts, but uh, but so that's interesting. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. Um, so, given that background, um, there's some overlap between human performance as as it comes uh, as you learned it and HPT. Can you share with us uh, some of the people or articles or books that were influential to you as you were? you know, beginning to climb the learning curve in this? Yeah, that's actually, so it's interesting that the first book and the set of names would be something that you're very familiar with as well. It's going to be Kepner and Trago. Mm -hmm. Um, So when I went to Riverbend, um, one thing that they did is they, at that station, and maybe Entergy did it at all the stations, I don't, I don't know for sure, but all system engineers, and we were considered system engineers in reactor engineering, all system engineers were put through a couple day, two, well, maybe three day training in Kepner Trego problem decision, mm-hmm. uh, potential problem opportunity analysis, right? All these, oh, these yeah. things. Yeah, because it, it's like 
it's it is a thinking set of thinking processes. And once everybody is in line with those thinking processes, how do you define what a problem is? How do you define what a cause is, right? And how are you going to validate that cause and then solve it, right? So that was my first real introduction to it. I mean, besides some corporate office, like, total quality management stuff that I'd gotten the year before. Mm-hmm. And, and the day I, this maybe, I don't know if it was the first or second day I showed up to work and somebody said, here's the QA manual. Read this. That's your training. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Binder, this thing, yeah. right? Uh, um, so it's like, yeah, I read that thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was that was some training right there. <laughs> well, that would be more akin to your engineering programs where you had to read thick books with tables and data and num- you know that kind of thing. Here, you'd be more used to that than the uh, than the typical liberal arts student. But uh, yeah, Kepner Trego was uh, was important. That whole uh, problem solving methodology and uh, um, uh, great tool, great tool. I, I remember uh, taking that back in the early '80s and. Uh, but uh, yeah, so there's a lot of people in the human performance technology field that might recognize that and might recognize the book that they put out, The New Rational Manager, um, which is kind of a classic. Um, let's shift gears here a little bit to, well, oh, so, but were there others? Were there others besides that? And, uh, you, know, you know, coming at this from a nuclear engineering perspective and the whole issue with human factors or human performance. And so what kinds of things did you learn about uh, there? And is, you know, there may be things that are of interest to uh, others coming from, you know, human performance to per- human from performance technology with, a, you know, from a different background. Yeah. So um, being or having the preoccupation that we had or that we have, we focus a lot on human, like the potential for human error. It, it's that's kind of not the term people like to use much anymore. Mm-hmm. But it, it was it was the name of a famous book by a fellow named James Reason, Human Error, and it that was one that he was he was one of the big names. Um, um, so, and I have that that my copy of that book is fairly dog-eared, right? It's I've been through it many times. Um, and then beyond James Reason, uh, he's, oh, I'm not sure he's still around, but he's done a lot of stuff in terms of, a. anybody that's involved in industrial safety is probably going to know James Reason and something called the Swiss cheese model, which is essentially the idea that if you put all the layers, all the barrier, all barriers, no barriers are perfect. This is the idea. No barriers, safety barriers are perfect. They all have holes. If all the holes line up, it like if you line up the Swiss cheese and, and a bad thing can get all the way through each layer of cheese, mm-hmm. the bad thing's going to happen at the end. So there's that's the most basic model is like your barriers need to, your barriers need to be intact, mm-hmm. right? Um, because they could even if they don't usually line up, they can line up on occasion given the right conditions, mm-hmm. right? So that's one of the more traditional models. There are there are newer models, right? And there are different ways of looking about it, looking at it now. Um, but uh, James Reason was is a is a big name in that space. Um, another one would be, uh, and I know I'm not going to say this name right, Jen uh, Jen Rasmussen or Rasmussen. Um, I can't recall the name of any of his books, but he he d- d- did a lot of work in in some of the same areas. And the thing from from him that I got was the idea of organizations that have boundaries, right? So you have a a boundary of what is essentially safe. And then you have, and you're operating in a space where you are trying to become more efficient. And as you become more efficient and you start pushing up against this boundary, you are essentially moving towards the boundary of safety just by becoming a leaner, now, I have a tendency to, to combine all the things that I've read in the past or learned in the past. So sure. I maybe, yeah. So, but this idea of efficiency, efficiency or leanness being somewhat brittle, I think I got that initially from Rasmussen. Mm-hmm. Um, 
because that's the idea that the more fat you take out, the less margin you have. Right. Right. Um, so when you talk to people that are really focused on production, they talk about eliminating barriers to getting work done. Mm-hmm. In nuclear or in safety, we talk about putting barriers in to keep bad things from happening, right? Yeah. So those yeah. those are that's cross purpose, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so you, if everything's a balance, and you got to find the way to become efficient without removing safety, right? Sa- that safety is a requirement. Production may be the goal, but safety is the requirement. Yeah. And that leads me to the next person I wanted to mention, which is Gold Rat. Because mm-hmm. Gold Rat always talked about, he said, what is the purpose of an organization or a business? So he would put it in terms of a business, and he'd say, the purpose of any business is to make money. But there are requirements. And I'm not sure if he used that word, but that's the way I think of it. It's like the requirement, the, the goal of a any, say, hot, any the, the 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 purpose the goal of any industrial facility is not to be safe. That's not the goal because if the goal was to be safe, you'd just knock that thing down and never go back to it, mm-hmm. right? It'd be safe. It'd be in the ground and no one would be there to get hurt. Um, the goal is to either make money, or in my case, to make power or whatever it is. There's a goal, which is why you're even there in the first place. But to have the license to do that. You must be safe. So that is an absolute critical requirement that must be met before you can even consider pushing towards your goal. Um, so, and there's all kinds of things that go with safety, right? There's safety and quality and reliability. And I think if anything in the nuclear business has shown over the last 30, 40 years is that you can't have quality at the expense of safety or reliability at the expense of quality. I mean, they all... But once, if you can build all of those up, you'll get you'll get productivity as a side benefit. Um, it's like the safest organizations in the nuclear business also tend to be the most productive mm-hmm. because it's that mindset, it's that culture of nothing, no problem is too, no stone is too small to leave unturned. That's a problem. I'm going after that. Oh, but it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, but it could one day, or it could be. It could mean something under other conditions. So, um, so I said, reason Rasmussen, Gold Rat, Gold Rat was huge, um, for me. Like I read, I read the novels first, and I started digging into some other stuff. Mm-hmm. So the whole idea of various thinking processes and just the way, the various tools he has, he had, right? Um, I used. Personally, a lot of those when I was doing uh, my root cause investigations, right? Mm-hmm. Um, now, one more person, and I've got the book here, and um, a more a more modern reference. His name is Sidney Decker, and um, I got his book back when I first was got really serious into in doing a root cause analysis and investigations. Now, he's not a big believer in cause per se. That's another discussion, but. The book that I had that I bought is called The Field Guide to Human Error Investigations. Okay. One thing I do when I read a book is if I start putting tabs in <laughs> every place where something means something to me or it strikes a chord. This is the densest I've ever had, right, in terms of that practice. This like I can turn to any one of these things and just pick and just start reading. It's like, yeah, that still means that's that still resonates. That's important. Mm-hmm. Sidney Decker is a great one. And he's a, um, if you do any kind of searches online for sa- like terms like safety 2.0 or the new view of human error, things, these things like that, anybody that's in safety right now will know, probably know his name. Excellent. So, Thank yeah. you for all of that. Uh, yeah, go, so Gold Rat is the only one that I knew because I read the goal and I not only read it, I listened to the audio tapes on long drives between Chicago and Detroit. And I listened to that, that series of uh, cassette tapes way back in the 90s uh, a couple of times. But uh, yeah, drum buffer rope and all of yeah. that good stuff. Um, so 
let me set up this next question here. So I'm going to ask you for your 30 second elevator speech on what you currently do. And I'm posing this as if you're at a neighborhood party and there's a new neighbor and they come over to you and they say, Billy, what do you do? Yeah, so um, I work in the in nuclear power business, and I develop and design training material for engineers, operators, and anybody else in that business, and we focus on safety, quality, and reliability. I don't know if I said that. That word came out a little fuzzy, but reliability. <laughs> yeah. Safety, quality, and reliability. Very, right? very good. So, so how long did it ho- take you to hone that uh, elevator speech down to just a one-floor elevator speech? Um, you know what? I've been thinking about it since you first uh, contacted me because I, I really wanted to resist the idea of going and saying something that's like, uh, you know, I d- like, well, something like I said on my LinkedIn profile, I develop, I design and develop full scope e-learning solutions, right? Like that, you know, that sounds good, but it's not what I do. Okay, it is what I do, but it, it it's not what you're going to just tell somebody. Mm-hmm. So in some cases, like, and I'm glad you put it in terms of like at the party, just a neighbor or somebody you're just meeting because that forces you to use plain language. And when you get down to plain language, it that's, you know, it makes it so much easier, mm-hmm. right? It's just, I don't have to try to invent something impressive. I'm just going to say, I'm just going to lay it out there. And you take it how you want. I'm not trying to impress you. So, <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Well, thank you. So as a lifelong learner, um, obviously, by the way, you uh, tab your books there. Uh, can you share with us what your current focus is or the next focus for your learning? Yeah. So one thing about me is um, I have a real problem with focus. Um, I, uh, I am all over the place. So, but in, in, in terms of what the thing, kinds of things that are turning me on learning wise at the moment, um, it is still and always, um, performance improvement methods and tools. So anything, um, that I see new that comes along, um, that has something to do with Performance improvement and or I should I should say that's also with that nuclear slant on it, right? So it's that safety and safety culture type slant. Mm-hmm. Um, so one thing, a book I just picked up um, by uh, Eric Hallnagel, I want to say, um, it's called The Efficiency Thoroughness Tradeoff. Mm. Mm, interesting, right? I think he calls it, he, he actually calls it the ETO principle, so the E-T-T-O, so Efficiency Thoroughness Tradeoff. Which is, that sounds like some, I haven't got too far into the book yet, but it sounds like something that's right up my alley, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Then there's stuff about resilience. Uh, There's a whole kind of body of research out there going on about high reliability organizations and resilience. Um, So what does that mean? In general, resilience in an organization means that you recover, you recover graceful, quickly and gracefully to keep solving problems even when the worst happens. Mm-hmm. Right? So you think about, say, mission control uh, during Apollo 13, right? That's resilience, right? They just keep, you don't have time, you don't have time, you don't have time to waste. You just keep solving problems and you keep going and you complete the mission, right? So that's one way of thinking about that one. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm always reading more stuff about, uh, because I'm doing e-learning right now, and I, and I say right now because I don't know if I'm going to still be doing this or even be in training five years from now because I tend to bounce around a bit um, and I've done different things, but they've all kind of been in this space associated with learning, performance improvement, problem solving. Um, yeah, that's kind of where I fit the best. Like I was just talking with my boss about it today. Like what's my next move? Cause he's starting to sense I'm getting to the, maybe the one to two year horizon for what do I want to do next? And, and he kind of put it this way. He said, you are really built to be a consultant. <laughs> so, um, but I'm also kind of, I don't feel the need to move around a whole lot. So internal consultant is fine with me. Mm-hmm. Um, 
don't know. I don't know where that's going to lead me, but I still enjoy doing things like um, like uh, self assessments. We we uh, we we have a very formal term for just looking at an a potential issue within your department or division or whatever, and say we're going to exam, we're going to turn this over, and we're going to look at it from all angles and decide if there's a problem here. And if we do find a problem, we're going to solve it. Or we're going to put actions in place to fix it so it doesn't come, so it doesn't become something that will bite us later. So it's kind of the proactive version of a root cause investigation, mm-hmm. looking for the problem first, and then trying to make sure you never get to the point where it becomes a real um, reactive thing. Um, so I just finished doing a, a self-assessment on how ready are we are for the. The, what I call the flash apocalypse, which is the death of Adobe Flash ah. uh, end of next year, mm-hmm. right? As of today, we still have 1,300 something objects, I'll say, to, to get rid of. Um, turns out we're in pretty good shape um, in terms of our, our, our burn down, but, you know, that's... That's one of those things where we we could have just like said, oh yeah, we're we're fine, and then you know come middle of next year we're like, oh man, we're screwed, right? So take a look at it now, see where you are, see if you need to make changes, and and to make the changes now. Mm-hmm. So get, it, um, get ahead of the curve, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So that, I still love doing that kind of stuff, and so anything having to do with performance improvement and learning, and then e-learning stuff as well. So uh, I really like. I'm starting to find more stuff like, say, Will Talheimer, right? I just uh, I conv- I got the corporate library to buy a copy of his book about smile sheets, so I'm starting to read that or performance focused smile sheets because mm-hmm. I'm interested in measurement too, mm-hmm. evaluation and measurement. And I um, used to be involved in like some data sciency type things, so I'm looking into that as well. Very cool. Yeah. Let me shift again uh, to the next question. Is there a favorite? human performance technology or human performance or safety term or phrase that you would like to define for us? Perhaps you see it being misused by many and you'd like to put your spin on it or just clarify it for our audience. What, what, what term would you, or phrase would you uh, do? Yeah. I have a couple if that's okay. Uh, And I, I, I won't go on too long about either one, but they're, they're a little bit related. So the word cause gets used a lot in a lot of different contexts. Um, and so in my, and, and it gets used in quality space or in safety space, or it's like, or if you think about like even what's in, going on in the news right now with the, with the Boeing 737, mm-hmm. like max jets, right? It's like, so you see lots of talk about cause. Um, so the word that I often have trouble with is the word cause and my version of combating the problem I see is to turn that into an acronym. Um, so for me, the word cause means conditioned, conditions and actions underlying a sequence of events. Right? So it's more than one thing. It's more than any one action. It's more than any one condition. And it is something that led to a sequence of events or supported a sequence of events and the thing to think about is that uh, when you think about cause in terms of something bad that happened like by the time you start thinking about cause you're looking back at it right so it's happened you know a lot more about what happened and the consequences than the people that were involved up front right you're looking you're looking back at it so when you think about cause, remember what I tell, try to tell people is that always remember that it's it's conditions and actions, and there was a sequence that happened, and you're looking back at it. You have hindsight, and hindsight. So you know the old there's an old saying that hindsight's twenty twenty. It's actually not twenty twenty. It's twenty fifteen, right? It's better than perfect vision because mm-hmm. you know you know what happened. And not only that, by the time once you know what happened, you've already started to think about things, what things you could have done to avoid it. Well, the people that were there had no idea, or if they did, they didn't have they didn't have clear knowledge, right? So they could have been thinking about 
all kinds of ways to get out of this under pressure, right? I, I still, th- I, I'm thinking about those pilots, right? Trying desperately to solve that problem. Like the system is fighting them, right? And to think about all the things they must have, must, must have been going through their minds. It's like, and all that responsibility. There's, you know, a hundred something people just behind them. That how how do you how do you just think about being that person? Mm-hmm. How do you deal with that, right? So, I guess that's the main one is, is cause. So you, you to, just just to just to think about it. It's by the time you start talking about cause, you're talking about it usually in hindsight, mm-hmm. and your your vision is seriously skewed from the people from that they were seeing it from the other side. And then the other one is, is model. Uh, the word model gets to me so much. A model, and I, I see it gets used for all kinds of things, but for me, the definition of the word model is a representation of reality. Right? So, it's not reality. Um, and it, it, it is... And when, it, when you say it's a representation, that means there's probably some kind of simplification. Otherwise, you wouldn't bother calling it a model, right? Um, and so there is one other name I wanted to mention here. It's a statistician um, that is sometimes kind of well-known in like statistical process control space. His name was George, I, I, let me, I'm going to get this right, George Edward Pelham Box. Um, he's passed away a few years ago. Um, but he has he he has a somewhat famous saying that all models are wrong. Some, however, are useful, mm-hmm. right? So, and people hear that and they think, well, I, I don't know. All are all models wrong? Yeah, they're wrong because they're simplified, and they and there are edge cases that are not being accounted for, right? So. It's a useful, hopefully, it's a useful simplification that allows you to think about things in, in, in a valuable way. But when you talk about models, you also have to remember that it's not perfect. It is wrong, and it's up to you to know when it can be wrong. Right? So know the limitations. Know, know the use and the limitations of any model you're going to employ. So that's that's my bit. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. All right. This is our uh, second to the last question. Uh, and we talked about this a little bit earlier. Uh, so I wanted to go back to some of your early days uh, and look for I was looking for stories uh, from you of people that were impactful to you. You can either tell a serious story or a funny story. And uh, you suggested before we started the recording here that you were going to acknowledge the impact of a couple of people, and one of them was one of your first supervisors. So what what story do you have to share with us about uh, uh, this person who was a a mentor uh, to you? Yeah. um, I should mention, before I mention this this other guy, I just want to mention my dad. Yes. I feel like I need to mention my dad because... Even though I sometimes I like to think that my dad and I are nothing alike, I am certain we are very much alike. Um, and a lot of the way I, because he's an engineer too, right? Um, he's retired now, but the way I think about the world in many ways was shaped by his work ethic and his dedication to his work. Um I am probably more like him than I would ever like to admit. <laughs> so true for many of uh, us. Yes. Yeah, I think so. Um, so, but then, I, so I'm going to well, mention his Harry. name. Who is who is this oh, guy? My, my dad. Well, this is great because my dad's name is Bill Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And, uh, and so was my grandfather too. I should, you know, if I'm going to mention, I'm going to mention my grandfather. My grandfather was a railroader mm-hmm. um, from West Virginia originally. So, and he was also Bill Wilson. So, at family gatherings, my grandfather was Bill, my dad was Billy, and I was little Billy. <laughs> right? So, I am, li- if you want to if you want to put little Billy I, on the I, thing. I will not thing. do that to you, but. Okay. All right. So. We'll just stick with that. Yeah. Them. So, yeah. We, we just have different middle names. That's uh-huh. it. Um, 
but I, I did, yeah. I so I, I mentioned I wanted to talk about my 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 first real supervisor in my first real job, the job I said that I couldn't believe they were paying paying me. He was a big part of that. He hired me, um, to my amazement, because I thought my interview went horribly. Um, but his name is Harry Goodman, and um, he uh, he had been a reactor engineer at another plant um, in in Mississippi. Um, but a lot of my outlook on what represents quality and how you should view your responsibilities to your to your work. Um, like I I I I have trouble remembering too many things that he said that didn't include the F word. So he was that kind of guy. He was very plain spoken, right? Like I, the the best one that I can remember is I'm just going to say F, right? So the because one time he I mean he would get mad, right? And so the one that I can remember is the only <laughs> yeah jeez oh, I just remembered the onlyest effing thing you effing effers had to effing do and you effing effed it up, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Um, which I think is a record. Um, he was he was to put it mildly a little a little angry at uh, the error that we had made because it was silly. Um, so is that the best way to go about expressing your displeasure about, you know, maybe not, but it sure made an impression about how important quality really is and how important it is to take your, your responsibilities and accountabilities seriously in this business. Um, so he he taught me a lot about being aware of things that had happened at other places um, as uh, lessons to be learned, right? So, in, in, again, in the nuclear business, we have this thing we call operating experience, which is a euphemism for stuff that happened elsewhere or stuff that happened here, but you better remember it. Right, because we don't want to experience that ourselves. Um, other places call it lessons learned. Some people just call it really just stories. Right? Mm-hmm. It's the story. It's the it's the legends. It's the parables. It's like don't go there. Right? Don't go there and do that. Or like the one, uh, the one. Uh, uh, oh, geez, I I think about this. So. Oh, I guess I wanted to bring up a, per, a particular phrase that he he never used this per, this particular word. It has since become an important set of words in nuclear power for engineers. But it's the the, the phrase is technical conscience. He never used those exact words, but that's what he taught me was having being having the technical conscience and being the technical conscience, which meant and still means that even if it is your assignment to push a project through or get something done, it is your responsibility to have a technical conscience and to say, you, and to say no, no more. I can't sign that. I'm not stamping that. That, that is not good with me, right? Um, and I was having a discussion with about this with some colleagues at work just yesterday, and we were because you know engineers, right? We're talking about what's going on in the engineering world right now. We're talking about Boeing, right? Mm-hmm. And we're talking about the design criteria for the seven thirty seven Max. There's going to be a lot of stuff coming out of that. We think there's going to be some serious doo doo coming out of that, right? Like. One of the design criteria for that jet was that it should require no additional training, right? It's like, whoa, right? Mm -hmm. When you think about it, you take that to its logical conclusion. Not only does that mean, well, it it means a lot of things. So, and I don't, now, again, like like I talked about earlier, hindsight, hindsight is 2015. I don't want to second guess anything. But we're trying to wrap our heads around this whole idea, right? 
we're already, I, I, and I'm certain that we're already already going to be using once once the more more of the story is known, we'll be using this as a case study um, for our uh, engineering continuing training series. Like every every year, mm -hmm. um, there's something where we go back and look at things like this. Um, so. But yeah, so back to Harry. What I got from Harry is what we would call now technical conscience. Um, and just a, a dedication to like working hard, right? I don't always live up to it. I try, <laughs> right? Um, but I always care about quality, no matter how much. This is funny. Like, I joke around a lot at work, and I work with a lot of co op students, right? So, and they know that I joke around a lot. But somehow, despite all the joking, they also know that I take quality really seriously, right? Like, they've seen me, like, when I've slipped up and let something through that actually got an impact a trainee. It's like they couldn't, they couldn't get past a page in one of my courses because I forgot that I did something incorrectly. That hit me hard. Every time one of those things hits, gets, happens, that's like... That's like someone punches me in the gut, right? And that's what I got from Harry. So, mm -hmm. yes. um, yeah. Well, thank you. Is there anybody yeah. else that you'd like to mention? Um, well, there. You know what? It's funny because that first that was actually my when I talk about Harry, I'm really talking about him. He hired me into that corporate office job, but then he was also he had moved to the plant, so I followed him mm -hmm. out to the plant. Um, and, uh, at, at that plant, there was a group of guys, we were the reactor engineering group and it was a very tight knit group. Like we, we had dinner together. We had lunch together. We, we were very tight knit. Um, cause it was kind of a unique little group at the station, right? Um, we were probably the only engineers that were always in the control room. Right, because our system, like we have system engineers for other things, like we have a we have a uh, pump, you know, a feed water system engineer or a turbine system engineer, generator, right? Well, our system was the reactor, right? So we were in the control room a lot, dealing directly with operators. Anytime we went, we needed to change power levels or do things uh, to to optimize the way we use the fuel or protect the fuel or control reactivity is, is one of the terms where we, we so reactivity control is, is, is kind of the phrase now. Um, so that group of guys, it was a funny little thing. And, it, and, and it, especially at the kind of reactor I was at, boiling water reactors, because I, you, you can move a single control rod six inches in, in one of those reactors and, and, and you're talking about, you know, gobs of power it's it's crazy how much power will increase just with small changes um um but so i'm just going to mention their names c really quick because they're really important to me um still even though i haven't talked to them in a while tony hewitt mark laris dory Krager, john vukovich and then the new guy at the time andy barrett he's still out there um but he's not doing that anymore he went on to work for the the nrc nuclear regulatory commission for a while but he does other stuff now but all those guys were and are very important to me. So, well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, it's important to uh, recognize our mentors, and some of them are, you know, the big names, the renowned gurus. But uh, we learn from everybody, and uh, the people that we work with, and our managers, our customers, um, and we just have to be open to that. But it's uh, good to uh, recognize them and understand uh, uh, and reflect on what they have taught you, and you have done that. Billy, I want to thank you so much for participating with me in this yep. Skype video interview. And my last question for you is, um, do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience related to performance improvement? And I'm uh, specifically looking for these words of wisdom or guidance for people who are coming new into the field of learning and development, training and development, e-learning, et cetera. What, what would you, uh, what's, your, what's your guidance? Well, it's funny because, you know, uh, of this whole talk, we, we haven't talked too much specifically about e-learning or training, right? And 
for me, it's it's one part of my career, right? I don't know how long I'm going to be doing this. It's 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 something I really enjoy, and it was something I always wanted to do, and I'm glad I've done because my dream is to one day put it all together somehow. So the performance improvement piece, the reactive part, the proactive part, and the learning part, put all that together. Mm-hmm. I don't know how I'm going to do that, but that was this was always kind of part of the plan. Um, if if I can be said to have a plan, so that that would be one of the things I would tell everybody um, is that to have kind of have a, a some kind of game plan, not necessarily to be a pinball like I am, and I'm probably dating myself by using that reference because most of the kids, the younger ones now, they think pinball. Oh, you mean that game on the on the <laughs> PlayStation, the Xbox, where the, the the thing goes around and bounces off things, right? Now I'm talking about the real thing. I'm talking about being a wizard on the pinball. Mm-hmm. That's 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 the real thing. Um, so it's it's to have a little bit of a, pl- a game plan. It doesn't and it doesn't have to be super detailed, but kind of have a vision of what you want in the end, right? Um, and then the other thing would be you can learn something from everyone. Even if and approach every relationship you have with that thought, I can learn something from this person. Even in those moments when you're thinking, God, this person is driving me insane, or this person, it's like, there, there are words that you could use. Mm-hmm. You might use it. Stop yourself and say, but I can learn something from this person. Um, whether it's how to, maybe maybe sometimes it will only be how to best get under someone else's skin. <laughs> but you can learn, that's a skill. You can learn it, and they might be the perfect teacher. So learn from everyone. Thank you, Billy. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing this Skype interview with me. You have a very interesting background. And uh, yeah, whereas most people come into uh, performance improvement fr- through learning, in the audience that I particularly hang out with and uh, am associated with, you come to learning from a performance improvement orientation. Yep. So it's kind of like you come in from the other side. Um, but uh, I hope that, uh, that what we've captured here is uh, meaningful to others to, as you say, learn from everybody. And I also like what you had to say about uh, technical consciousness. Uh, all of us that are in the business, whether it's on just the learning side or expanding into overall performance improvement, um, we need to start being more proactive. We need to have a technical conscious, uh, always do the right thing, always look at uh, all the variables and don't sign off on anything uh, that you shouldn't. So so thank you so much for your time this, today and I uh, hope you have a great day. Yeah. Thank you so much. This, this has really been, uh, it's quite an honor, actually, Guy, because uh, I'm, you know, I, I think I told you last time we talked, I was like, I'm just a ground level guy. I'm just, I'm just a practitioner, right? I, I'm nobody famous. I'm, and I I don't have a book. I don't, I have, don't have a high powered career. Um, but uh, I love this stuff and I do it. So that's, that's me. That, that was all of us, Billy. That was all of us. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> have a good night. Yeah. yeah. You too. Thanks a lot. Right, bye bye. Yeah. Here we go.